Hi Year 11, so back again and we're still doing the November 2018 AQA Paper 2 exam paper and we've finally made our way to section B which is the writing section and I like this writing section. Um, I prefer personally writing non-fiction writing that's where my skills lie and I also find that this is a really easy kind of question to do because you don't even have to use your brain that much obviously the better your general knowledge is uh, the better things are going to be for your answer overall but um, you don't really have to think of too much because they give you everything that you need to know right there in the actual question itself so that's kind of all you need to do if you read and understand the question and have those tips at your fingertips for being able to chunk it up and plan an answer everybody can write a good answer to this question five writing to argue so let's have a look at the question to start off with. So um, it's called section B writing and it says you are advised to spend about 45 minutes on this section. So that's really good advice. Now I'll always advise everybody to read the two sources when you get into the exam and to read through the whole booklet with all the questions in it so you know what's coming up. But when you've done that, you don't necessarily have to answer the question starting at one and going chronologically through them. If you love writing to argue and you want to do that first because you know that's where you shine, do question five first. The only way that you might be slightly disadvantaged is you might want to steal an anecdote from source A or source B, or you might want to steal a fact or a statistic or your expert from source A and source B. And obviously if you've answered all the reading section first, you'll know how to quickly find those. But you don't have to relate or refer to source A or source B at all. That's totally optional. So for some of you, it might really suit your exam technique to actually start with question five first. It's something worth thinking about when you're revising, when you're doing practice papers, especially if you know that you're tempted to overrun on the reading section. So 45 minutes. Now some fairly obvious advice here. You need to write in full sentences. Well, of course you do. Full sentences, please. Standard English and grammar. We don't want to see emojis in your writing. And I really don't think that question five paper two is a place for slang or swear words or anything like that. OK, it is deliberately meant to be quite a formal piece of writing. Yes, you can vary up your tone and make it a little bit more chatty, depending on what your audience is. But really, this should be a nice formal piece of writing. And then it usefully says, as I always say to you, leave enough time to check your work at the end. And if you say if you manage your time, if you're managing your time nicely, you've got about 40 minutes to plan and write. And that should leave you five minutes to do your checking. If you do a minute per mark, as I always suggest. So um, here's the question then. Cars are noisy, dirty, smelly and downright dangerous. They should be banned from all town and city centres, allowing people to walk and cycle in peace. Write a letter to the Minister for Transport arguing your point of view on this statement. OK, so that's the title and we're going to break that down in various ways in a minute. But when you're reading through for the first time, you need to think about your first thoughts, your first impression of that question. Think about this statement and you're thinking to yourself, do you agree with that statement or do you disagree with that statement? And when you've decided if you agree or disagree, think about why. And my top tip for this question is pick a side. Don't 
flibble flobble around like going oh but on one hand this and on the other hand that no it says write a letter arguing your point of view arguing and arguments tend to be one-sided okay you might counter the opposition and that's fine that's a really good rhetorical technique but they tend to be one-sided and it's a much easier to write kind of almost like a controlled rant basically so you're just going to be quite one-sided for most of it um i've put don't try to argue both sides it's too tricky and it can end up being really vague and you see people doing that maybe because they've been trained to do that they think that's the right thing to do i say no pick a side and stick with your side okay if you're very clever you might not necessarily pick the side that you personally agree with you might deliberately pick the other side because you think you can have a little bit of fun with it and that's also fine but you need to remain convincing throughout right so let's think about how to chunk this question down a little bit okay so this is part of your planning process don't just go straight into it you need to pick the question apart um, there's two mnemonics, which um, one of them is really, really popular and used in loads of schools, and that's FLAP. So FLAP stands for Form, Language, Audience and Purpose. And if you have a look over here, you can see that the form of the writing is a letter. The audience is the minister for transport, so a politician, quite an important politician. And the purpose is arguing, okay? And on this question five, it's actually always arguing. They don't always say arguing. Sometimes they'll say, explain your point of view, okay? Um, or persuade them to agree with your point of view, okay? But basically, it's always arguing. So if you just have, right, question five is arguing, have that in your head, okay? Because it always is. And then language is something that we will think about in the planning process. Now, this is my mnemonic, which I made up myself, and it's a bit more detailed. It's kind of based on flat, but it just goes into it a little bit more. Um, F for form, which we've talked about. Um, T for tone. So you're going to think about like each paragraph, what kind of tone of voice you're going to use. So if you watched my video on how to write question four, you'll notice these non-fiction writers, they don't keep a, the same serious, boring tone all the way through. They might start off quite angry and then they might get a bit sarcastic then they might use very emotional emotive tone and then they might be very serious maybe giving some statistics or some facts or something like that and then they might use humor to try and win over the audience so you will want to think about what tone your writing is going to take and how that tone is going to shift as you go through your writing. So you can see that with that tone, we're stepping up from flap straight away. So if you're aiming for those sevens, eights and nines, this might be a more useful mnemonic to think about. We've got purpose in both. So we know that that's arguing. And we've got audience in both. And here our audience is Minister for Transport. I've added in viewpoints into mine. And there's two reasons why I bring in viewpoints and I've got that annotated on the next page. So I'll show you what I mean by viewpoints in a minute. And then where I put S for style down here, that kind of equals language on flap. OK, so S for style, what stylistic techniques are you going to use to make your writing really engaging, really persuasive, really argumentative? And then finally, last but not least, is content so it's all very well having a fancy piece of writing but if you don't have any good ideas to put inside your writing you've got nothing so content is your ideas and actually i'm going to show you in a second why you don't even need any ideas it's so wonderful i love this question okay so um we talked about form audience purpose i mentioned tone 
I've written down here exactly what I said on the previous slide. You're going to use those question four skills. Are you going to be angry, sarcastic, concerned, confused, a little bit funny, whatever, but you're going to vary your tone, okay? You need to be nice and formal, but you can vary your tone throughout. You kind of want to take your audience on a ride, like an emotional roller coaster. Never write that in your essay. But that's what you're trying to do. Bring them up, bring them down, make them scared, make them happy. That's kind of the idea of your writing. That's what you want to do. Um, okay, let's think about viewpoints then, because viewpoints kind of mean two, two different things. First of all, who are you going to be? Are you going to be yourself when you write? Are you going to be this kind of keen, earnest, um, year 11 student who's writing a very polite letter to your local politician who happens to be the Minister for Transport? or just the real Minister for Transport about something you feel really passionately about? Or are you going to adopt a persona? Can you have a bit of fun if you pretend to be someone else? Could you be Karen from Tilehurst, for example? Could you imagine that you are Greta Thunberg? Remember that young girl who's only a couple of years older than you, who is trying to save the environment and taking down politicians, she could be the kind of person who might write a statement like, um, who might uh, write a statement like this. So it could be her writing that letter. But then you could think about, maybe it could be some kind of petrol head. So someone like Jeremy Clarkson, um, I can't remember what his program's called now, the Grand Tour, something like that. Someone who loves cars, who loves being all blokey, who's a bit of a, a gammon, as I call him, a kind of a red-faced, middle-aged, uh, wealthy man who gets angry about things. So he could be writing this letter because he's so angry about this statement. Okay. So that's your first viewpoint you want to think about whose viewpoint are you going to write from are you going to be yourself or are you going to write in a character and write in a persona and it's fine if you want to do that it can be really fun um but then you need to think about whose viewpoints do you need to take into account when you're writing so i put some ideas here obviously you need to think about the minister for transport's own viewpoint so would it save him money if he got cars off the road, for example? Uh, would it make him look better in the workplace if they got cars off the road, whatever? But other people that you might want to think about their viewpoints, commuters who have to get to work, busy parents who've got to do the school run before they get themselves to work, the car manufacturing industry. Um, what about them? Like if you're going to ban cars, uh, you might think about the local council. This could be a really good way to save money and earn money um, by doing this. Um, what about disabled people? How are they going to be able to get to work or to go shopping if you can't take cars? So those are just a few viewpoints that I thought about when I was quickly putting these slides together. Okay, so um, that's what viewpoints means. And by thinking about your own viewpoint, that can help you to create a really good voice for writing your own argument. And for thinking about other people's viewpoints, it helps you to develop and explain your ideas so much better because you're not just in your narrow little world of being a 15 or 16 year old who's who's just concerned about me, me, me all the time. OK, widen up those viewpoints and perspectives. Think about other people. So we if we look at this mnemonic down here, we've done form, we talked about form, we thought, talked about tone, we thought about purpose, that's straightforward. We thought about our audience, who is Minister of Transport, politician, posh, gets lots of letters, I'm thinking about him a bit more, needs to be really formal, doesn't it? We've thought about all these different viewpoints over here. What have we got left? Style and content. And that's what we're going to think about next. And this is where we're going to start putting a plan together. And this is the way that I always plan. And I'd always plan like this. If you're going to be delighted just to get any grade, a one or a two on this exam, you can still plan it like this. If you're aiming for a level nine on this paper, you can still plan it like this. It, it really, really works, this kind of five paragraph structure. If you're just trying to get like quite a basic grade, like a simple four, just stick 
really, really safely to the five paragraphs. If you're trying to get a nine, you stick to the basic structure of five paragraphs, but maybe you can put in there some clever little one sentence paragraphs. You can have almost like a repeated kind of chorus of rhetorical devices, for example. So you can kind of like pimp your five paragraph structure if you're aiming for the top marks. Having said that, you don't even need to, like five paragraphs works and you can still get like really, really top band just with five paragraphs. It's a nice symmetry about five. You've got quite a short intro and conclusion and they're both about equal length, quite short. Um, and then two builds into three, which is quite a meaty paragraph, like kind of dies down into four. And you can see like it's got that kind of structure, that like emotional roller coaster. I hate that expression. But I'm like that kind of structure though that you can take your reader on this narrative arc when you're persuading them and arguing your point of view. Okay, so maybe in your margin in your exam booklet you can write down paragraph one, intro, two, three, four, five brackets conclusion. So five paragraph structure. In here you're going to write down your main ideas in here and on the right you're going to write down the different style devices that you're going to use to really bring your argument to life okay so that's what it means say so content and style content your ideas and style are the devices that you're going to use and i'm suggesting that you go with dark forest devices and i've got three dark forest devices which i love and i suggest you always use them again whatever your ability whatever grade you're aiming for these three key devices work so well out of the dark forest mnemonic okay so um there's a couple of ways you can think about your ideas and like i said before you don't need to even come up with your own ideas because they are all in the statement so this is what we can do forget about intro and conclusion for the minute just forget about those talk about them in a second can you chunk it down like this so first big idea in paragraph two you're going to explain why cars are noisy, dirty, smelly, and dangerous. You're gonna explain that in paragraph two. Or if you're arguing the other point of view, why they aren't noisy, dirty, smelly, and why they're not dangerous. Okay, that's gonna be in paragraph two possibly. Then we look at the next bit. They should be banned from all town and city centers. So in your third paragraph, this is your next idea. Why stinky cars should be banned from city centers. So you haven't had to come up with a single original idea yet. Or if you're arguing the other point of view, why they shouldn't be banned. And then in your last paragraph, paragraph four, um, how we can allow people to walk and cycle in peace. OK, so that's going to go in paragraph four. So you can see one, two, three big ideas go just here and then all we've got to think about then is popping an intro on it and what we're going to put in our conclusion okay all the ideas done for you in the statement you just need to chunk it down I've chunked it down in a different way on the next slide have a look so in this one I've gone with a slightly different chunk I've gone for the first one cars are noisy dirty and smelly and what I've translated that into here is cars cause pollution there we go. And I put in brackets, noisy, dirty, smelly. OK, uh, just to link it back there. And then I've kind of lengthened the second point. They're dangerous and should be banned. OK, so I've kind of lumped those two points together. You see, I've chunked up a bit differently. I put here cars are dangerous, drunk drivers, careless drivers should be banned. And that's going in paragraph three. And then allowing people to walk and cycle in peace. I put here, I'm going to go off my arguing a bit and I'm going to give a bit of advice. Advice on how to allow ease of walking and cycling after we banned the stinky cars. OK, so that's what I'm going for. Now you may ask, that's all very well. I've got my three big ideas, but what on earth is going to go into my introduction? Well, this is what I would suggest goes in your intro. First of all, it's going to be something we call a salutation. So because it is a letter in this one, a salutation means dear whatever. And if we know the Minister for Transport's name, 
we can say dear mrs smith okay um and that's your salutation it's as simple as that and you can make it up if you don't know who the minister for transport is you can absolutely make it up it is not a problem if you were worried your examiner doesn't know who mrs smith is you could put dear mrs smith brackets minister for transport and that's absolutely fine and then if you want to refer to her during your um argument you can call her mrs smith again and then we like your reader knows who she is okay if you don't want to give them a name you can start off with dear sir or madam dear sir or madam okay and there should be capital s for sir slash madam capital m for madam all right so that's what i mean by salutation now you don't always get a letter this one happens to be a letter there are three other options of things that you could get and the other one it could be it could be a speech and you obviously don't have a salutation in a speech but you do need to greet your audience so if they say you need to write a speech to deliver to assembly to year sevens the equivalent of your salutation would be good afternoon year sevens welcome to my assembly okay just like the kind of nonsense that you see when you go and have to watch an assembly given by someone in a different year group or an outside visitor so that's your salutation for a speech if it's a newspaper article you won't have a salutation at all you'll need to come up with a headline okay it's a nice headline if it is a newspaper article and that's one of the other options now the fourth option of what this argument could be is an essay like a traditional old-fashioned essay so it could be kind of like an essay which might be going in a newsletter to parents or something like that and um, i've never known a qa to set an essay in so many years of marking and so many different versions of this exam paper i don't think it's going to be an essay but if you do get an essay i would just kind of treat it like a newspaper article i think that's what i would do um if you do an example called ocr they quite often set an essay because they're they tend to be a little bit more traditional and that's the kind of thing that they do so salutation you need to think about the form so you know what your salutation is going to be um, and then the next thing you can do and it doesn't really matter which style of writing which form of writing you are taking you're going to do your five w's so that's your who what where when why who, what, where, when, why, and you're going to put those into a topic sentence. What might really, really help you to do your five W's is to think about who might have said this. I, I'm just thinking, you know, I can't get past Greta Thunberg myself. Cars are noisy, dirty, smelly, and downright dangerous. They should be banned from all town and city centres, allowing people to walk and cycle in peace. Um, so you could start off with something like, Dear Minister for Transport, uh, Miss Smith, um, I'm writing to you today in response to what Greta Thunberg said at a conference last week, that's your where, last week, that's your when, your who is Greta Thunberg. And then you can just write down the statement in your own words. When she said cars are noisy, dirty, smelly and dangerous, they should be banned. So um, and I absolutely agree with her. What are you going to do about it? Yeah, something along those lines. So um, really easy introduction, isn't it? Um, and then for your conclusion, all you're going to do down for your conclusion is summarise the key points that you've made here, here and here. Um, and maybe you'll do that as I put over in style techniques as, as a list, a yeah, list of three because there's three things. So that's really, easy, really, really easy thing to do. Um, so. There's your ideas. It's easy, isn't it? So far, you have not had to have an original thought in your head. All you're doing is chunking down the exam question and putting it into a into an order. Really, really easy. And now what we're going to do, we've got all our ideas together. We're going to add some style devices. 
And so I just did it without even thinking. I put a rhetorical question in. I said, didn't I? What, so what are you going to do about it? Because I agree with her. OK, um, I'm going to say I'm going to use a rhetorical question in my intro and I'm also going to add in maybe some emotive language in my intro as well. I like an, a rhetorical question up here because then in my conclusion, I can link my conclusion back to my intro and maybe answer the rhetorical question that I posed back here. And that is going to give you marks for structure because your examiner will see that you've kind of come full circle with your argument and you're showing a lovely, like I said, this narrative arc to your argument where you're linking back to the points that you made right at the beginning. OK, and as I said before, you could list your main points. So do you now agree with me that cars cause pollution are dangerous and um disrupt pedestrians be better than that that was rubbish but you you get the point that i mean now here are my three favorites expert anecdote and acknowledge the opposition these are totally my favorites because if you're like i love writing stories but i hate writing arguments you can still kind of write a story inside your argument by totally making up a fake expert. I think Donald Trump's been doing it for the last four years, if that's not libelous. Um, kind of make up experts, pick your experts and, and make up some facts and statistics. We'll talk more about how to do that in a moment. And then anecdote is also a little bit like creative writing. So an anecdote is like a true life story. So you might give an anecdote about yourself, about this terrible thing that happened. The guy in the cycling extract did that. He talks about how tragically he was knocked into the curb and had he not wobbled and kept his balance, he could have been crushed by a truck. I'm exaggerating more than he did. But that's a really good example of an anecdote. The Countess in Source B gave an anecdote about how she rode for four or five hours her bike and was all hot and streaming with sweat by the time she got there and, and nearly fainted like the Victorian lady that she is. Uh, an anecdote, like a true life story. When I write arguments, when I'm in class and I'm kind of modelling arguments, I like to make up some really emotive people, a bit like the charity adverts. So one of my favourites is poor Billy. He was just a seven year old boy when he was deserted by, and so it goes on, or poor old Molly. She just wanted to go to Tesco's to get a loaf of bread and a pint of milk for her cup of tea. Do you see what I mean? So you can kind of make up your real life story. Um, you, I, I didn't actually put down there for anecdote emotive language, but emotive language often goes so well with an anecdote. So anecdote is a true life story. You see, using expert and anecdote, you really can unleash your creative monster um, and, and make something quite exaggerated and have a little bit of fun with those. And I've given you a couple of examples of those on the next page. Um, and, and the third one that I talked about is acknowledging the opposition. So you like what you have to do is predict what they are going to argue back to you. And you tell them what they're going to say. Yeah, I know that you're going to say this, so you can use that direct address. But I'm telling you that you're wrong. and This is why you're wrong. So it's sometimes also called preempting the opposition as well, acknowledging the opposition. You acknowledge that they've got a point. This is what they're going to say. But then you destroy their argument before they have a chance to pose it to you. OK, so those are my three that I would always use the expert the anecdote and acknowledge the opposition. OK, and um, as I said, I'll give you some examples now. OK, so for the win, anecdote, expert, acknowledge the opposition. Don't know what that's doing in there. There must have been a reason I put that there. I think that's me trying to say, don't forget to use source A and source B for some ideas for your argument. OK, right. Here we go then. So what I've done here is I've done my paragraph two. 
okay i've done an expert i've used some facts and i've used some statistics and hopefully what you'll see that i've done is i have made them up i've totally made them up i didn't really have time to do research if you're sitting in in the hall at school or in the gym or whatever you don't have google there to look up some statistics make them up make them sound realistic if you have great knowledge about the topic and you don't have to make them up then don't make them up use the real ones that's amazing but most of you even the most brilliant of you don't have these statistics at your fingertips right here we go here's my paragraph surely it cannot come as a great surprise to you that cars cause 78 percent of air pollution in built-up areas sheila smith professor of urban environment at harvard university states that smog in los angeles has exacerbated incidences of asthma in children aged 5 to 18. Before starting school, asthmatic children have their condition under good control, Smith reveals. Yet, when these youngsters start walking to school and breathing in the noxious fumes expelled by dirty vehicles, their likelihood of suffering a severe asthma attack increases fourfold. The irony is that this forces parents to transport their offspring to school by car, just compounding the problem. Do you want our children to suffer a similar fate, Minister? OK, so I've actually added in a bonus rhetorical question there as well. So I've made up my expert. She sounds real enough, doesn't she? Sheila Smith, Professor of Urban Environment at Harvard University. So I've used a real university. Um, I've used an example from America, which uh, might be a bit strange but i thought if she's harvard then she's probably talking about uh, america and even though i'm being quite formulaic in my planning and saying everyone whatever ability you are you can all use your plan like this i think i've used some really good vocabulary in here so i've used words like noxious expelled from the semantic field of pollution, aren't they? I've used some medical terms like asthmatic children, good control, their condition. I've used some really fancy vocab like exacerbated. Instead of just using a plain word, I've put incidences. I've used increases fourfold. I was trying to put increases by 120% and then I was like, oh, that just sounds really wrong. So I thought fourfold, it sounds quite old fashioned and compounding the whole problem. And when you're using your expert, don't do it like a radio interview. We spoke to Mrs. Smith and this is what she said. You don't do it like that. You can see how I've just let her tell her own story and I've put Smith reveals. And then when she finishes, I've just left her there just left her and gone back to being myself again okay so not like a radio interview just drop in some big quotation that she said which backs up your point okay and i've remembered my audience and i've linked it to him with that bonus rhetorical question which i didn't plan for right i've had a go at doing an anecdote So let's have a look at my anecdote. Not only are cars dreadful pollutants, they are also death machines. As Peter Walker of The Guardian points out, every time a driver flicks that ignition switch, he or she is in charge of a ton of metal and glass that could cause a deadly impact. Couple this with the anger and frustration felt by so many drivers trying to navigate the congested rush hour traffic whilst running late for work, and you have a recipe for disaster. Take Frankie Jones. She was quietly cycling to work in Canary Wharf when an impatient car driver veered left in a futile attempt to undertake a bus. Jones was forced into the gutter where she lost her balance and tumbled off her bike, only to be nudged by a following vehicle. Fortunately, Frankie survived, but had severe concussion as well as a broken pelvis which kept her off work for several months. The innocent driver who nudged Frankie has had to live with undeserved guilt. By removing cars from the roads, Minister, incidents like this simply wouldn't happen. So you can see there that I've used an anecdote. 
I didn't do as much contrast as I was meaning to. So I have got before and after, but it's kind of like quite a sad before and the after is quite sad as well. No one really comes out well out of this. But can you see when I'm doing my anecdote, this is such an excuse for me to really pour on the emotive language and the exaggeration actually as well as what the deadly impact. I felt like a daytime TV show when I said that a ton of metal and glass. It's really dramatic language, isn't it? Um, I've still managed to get some decent vocab in here, veered left, futile attempt, um, but then some more emotive language forced into the gutter. She tumbled off her bike. Um, some medical language, a severe concussion, broken pelvis, I've used that. You probably know words like that from like doing PE studies or health and social or whatever. So use, language from your other subjects. I've addressed the minister again, so I've used that direct address to him. Um, and here's kind of like the after, like this would never have happened if you'd removed those those cars from the road, minister, This these terrible things. Now, hopefully what you can see as well is I'm not just working the language and the style in these two model paragraphs. I'm also working my sentence structures. So you see, I've got an LY one. Surely it cannot come as a surprise to you. Um, I've got one which is starting with a preposition here, before starting school, comma, asthmatic children have. I've used my speech marks to embed this speech in. And obviously, whenever you use a rhetorical question, like you're varying up your punctuation there as well. OK, I've used some really quite long, complex sentences, but I've broken down the clauses by using commas. And over on this one, what I've tried to do is think about linking my paragraphs not only but also so i've finished writing this paragraph about cars causing all this horrible pollution and making children ill and then i've said not only are they dreadful pollutants so linking back now i'm looking forward so i'm signposting that also death machines and hopefully you can see in both paragraphs i brought it back to the audience to kind of summarise the points that I've made. OK, I've told you what the problem is. Now, this is what you've got to do about it. OK, so I'm going to leave you with a task to do. I want you to have a go after this video finishes at writing paragraph four. So if you remember, that's advice on how to allow ease of walking and cycling. We're going to use some direct address and acknowledge the opposition. So here's your little mini plan. Explain what you think the transport minister is going to grumble about. Is it going to be too expensive? Are loads of people going to complain? Does he think that drivers have more rights than any other road users? And then secondly, you're going to make the solution easy for him. So here's some ideas for solutions that you could write in your paragraph four. Um, simply painting lines on the road, that's cheap. Making huge car parks on the edge of town, park and ride, cycle hire schemes, electric scooters. You could impose huge fines for people who break rules. To make sure that you're using direct address, you could use words like you and bossy verbs, imperative verbs like build, paint, charge. Um, and then you could offer some suggestions to the minister by using your modal verbs. So you could do this, you should do that, you must do this, you could try, you might want to think about those kind of modal auxiliaries. And then what I want you to do at the beginning of paragraph four is link it back to paragraph three and maybe even paragraph two. So you might want to start your paragraph with something like, I have complained a lot about the problems that cars cause on the road. Now I would like to offer you some suggestions and solutions or I know that you're going to say something like that so linking it back and then your challenge if you are aiming for those sevens, eights and nines is to try to use some fancy vocabulary better known as sophisticated vocabulary and try and use that appropriately. So you can see in my two examples Hopefully you don't think I sound as if I've eaten the thesaurus. I've used some really good vocab, but it's not like every word. It's just peppered in there to show the examiner that I've got a good vocabulary that I'm in charge of. I'm not just putting it all there just for the sake of it. I'm just 
peppering it through. Okay, so that's your challenge. Try and use some fancy vocab, but try and use that appropriately. All right, so those are your three big paragraphs. As you can see from what I've taught through intro and conclusion, they're going to be kind of short. So don't stress about those. And I've told you the kinds of things that you can put in those. If you want to practice intro and conclusion and putting it all together, that is also brilliant. I hope that you found this video really, really useful. And if you've got any questions or comments, then you can put them in the comments underneath or you can email me directly or put it on Teams or something like that. Okay, good luck with your exams, Year 11s. Bye.